Welcome everybody, thank you very much for coming. We're going to be going on a journey. We're going to be going on a journey through the whole history of the World Wide Web. And the full series is being published on simpleprogrammer.com. And the first part is already published, and the second part in the series will be published tomorrow. And that will cover the early years of the World Wide Web. And it will go into more detail than I can cover tonight. And we'll begin our story in the year 1990. So the World Wide Web was created by Tim Berners-Lee. And he was working at the Particle Physics Research Center, CERN. And for about a year, he was trying to get uh, approval for his plan for uh, what we would call the World Wide Web. He uh, wrote a proposal called Inform Manage Information Management, a proposal. And uh, he just didn't get any reply for a year. And then he resubmitted it in May and still nothing. Um, but then he said to his boss, I really need to get a, a next computer. And his boss agreed and said, once you get your machine, why not try programming that hypertext thing on it? So he got started and uh, he got working with someone called Robert Caillou. And um, the, once they had a kind of a early prototype of the World Wide Web, they went to the European Conference on Hypertext Technology to pitch the idea. And they thought uh, someone would be able to uh, take the project on and develop it further for them. Um, but they found that although it was a conference on hypertext technology, not many people really understood the idea of the World Wide Web. Um, one of the comments was, uh, you should have a central link database because otherwise you're going to get uh, broken links everywhere. Um, so they didn't really understand the idea of this World Wide Web is going to be completely decentralized. Um, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented a hypertext markup language. So that was a simplified version of a markup language that was already around at that time called SGML. And the early version of World Wide Web only worked on the next platform. Um, so what's the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web? A uh, simple explanation, and quite a nice one I think, is the internet is all about connecting computers together, whereas the World Wide Web is all about connecting people together. And also this year we had uh, the invention of Linux, uh, the founding of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we had the first trellis modulated modem at 44.4 kilobits per second. Who remembers 44.4 uh, kilobits per second? How many of you remember what that feels like? One person. <laughs> this is what it feels like. <laughs> um, but the next year, uh, things started improving. We had the High Performance Computing Act, also known as the Gold Bill, passed into law, which funded faster networks. And the main event of the year was uh, the browser. The first browser, World Wide Web, was released publicly in August. And uh, it, it, the first uh, site outside of uh, CERN to be connected was Stanford Linear Accelerator. And that was connected by HTTP, which uh, Tim Berners-Lee and uh, his colleagues also invented. And uh, the most popular website in the world at that time was CERN website, which reached 100 hits a day. And uh, the following year, we had a couple of um, competing or supporting browsers, if you like, uh, uh, Erwise and Viola www. And also this year, in the UK, we had Pipex and Demon Internet springing up, and there were a million computers connected to the internet, although most of them were not connected to the World Wide Web. Um, but it was the following year uh, when Mosaic Browser was created by two undergraduates, Eric Biener and Mark Andreessen, and that was uh, funds from the High Performance Computing Act uh, funding that. and. Uh, once that was released, there was a sharp spike in the number of people using the World Wide Web. 
because it was such a big improvement over the earlier browsers. It was much easier to use and also quite powerful for the time. The following year, um, a guy called Jay Allard, he's most famous for his work on Xbox these days. Um, at this time, he was, had been for a while saying, the internet's going to be a really big thing. And uh, not everyone at Microsoft really understood why the internet was such a big thing because they were very much focused on uh, desktop operating systems at that time. He wrote a memo called Windows, the next killer application on the internet. And it's available online publicly. And it's still a, a very good, uh, interesting read and that explains the whole landscape of the internet at the time. And in that document, he says uh, the current implementation of uh, Mozilla for Windows is considerably weaker than its, un its counterpart. And he explains a strategy for kind of catching up with their competitors and uh, also uh, succeeding their competitors. Um, also this year, Netscape. Um, so Mark Andreessen founded a Mosaic Communications Corporation with a, a businessman called Jim Clark who left uh, Silicon Graphics and uh, the original idea for their product was they would work with Nintendo on the N64 and work uh, pro providing internet services for the games console uh, but that never happened so instead they, they decided to create a web browser at and uh, that would be called Netscape Navigator. And that proved very popular very quickly. But also this year, we have uh, Sun Microsystems getting involved in the internet. Um, James Gosling uh, wrote the Oak programming language, but for trademark reasons, they renamed that to Java. And uh, they were intending originally to use this technology uh, to work with table cable TV companies, um, but that deal didn't really work out either. So they decided they would uh, retarget the technology for the internet. So the last thing, major thing that happened in 1994 is the founding of the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, various different companies attended the first meeting. And at the time, there were a lot of different extensions to HTML being proposed. And they realized that the first thing they needed to do was to standardize HTML. And they discussed, well, should they be following, issuing recommendations, or should they be dictating standards? And they felt that to get to full standards would take too long. So they say they, they would issue recommendations instead. But 1995 was the year things started to get a bit crazy. Uh, everybody wanting to have a piece of the uh, World Wide Web and the internet. Uh, Java 1 was released and major web browsers soon uh, were running Java applets within their web pages. We had the founding of Amazon.com and Auction Web. And if you don't know who Auction Web are, I'll explain in a minute. And we had the first MP3 player this year as well. And this was the year that uh, Bill Gates became fully convinced that uh, the internet was the way to go. And he, he published a memo saying, now I assign the internet the highest level of importance. And uh, Internet Explorer was bundled with Windows 95. And uh, do any of you know uh, which language did this man create in 10 days in May 1995? JavaScript. JavaScript. It's close, but it's not quite the answer I'm looking for. The answer, and it's a bit of a trick question, I'm afraid, <laughs> it's Mocha. Um, so Mocha was the name that uh, was, orig well, the original code name was Mocha. Um, but then the marketing department decided LiveScript would be a, a better name for it. Um, uh, but at, at this time, um, Netscape had a kind of partnership with Sun Microsystems uh, competing against Microsoft because they realized that Microsoft uh, 
could dominate if they were, they were allowed to. So uh, they, they decided uh, that they'd partner up and uh, Sun Microsystems said, uh, we, we really want to uh, popularize Java and this live script thing is just a bit of a distraction. So please just, just kill it. Worry. And uh, they didn't really want to do that. So they said, well, if you, if you want to popularize Java, let's call this thing JavaScript. We can be like the, the little brother of Java. And um, Sun Microsystems, they weren't sure at first, but they, they signed the agreement to do that. And, and I'll explain ECMAScript in a minute. Oh, here, Brendan Eich, um, he's saying that it was basically a marketing scam. So, yeah, you've heard it from him. Um, next year, cascading style sheets. Why, why are these important? Well, on the left here, we have a site without the CSS enabled. And here it, it's enabled. So we see there's a massive difference in the look and feel of a site uh, with CSS. Also this year we had Internet Explorer 3 and that had CSS support and JScript which is kind of reverse engineered JavaScript if you like. And uh, this year Apache became the top HTTP server and has been ever since. And uh, Netscape Navigator 2, uh, Future Splash Animator was created by uh, Future Wave. And uh, Disney Online were one of the first companies to use it, and they were also using uh, Macromedia Shockwave at the time. And they uh, spoke to Macromedia, and they said, this is brilliant. And uh, Macromedia decided they were going to buy out the company, and they renamed it to Macromedia Flash. And also this year, we had the first uh, MVC web application framework, which was called Web Objects. And we also had the specification for IPv6 because some people were worried that we only had 4 billion addresses and we were going to run out. And I still think that was, um, that, that was quite good foresight because a lot of things are in our industry are 10 minutes before it's going to happen we realise something bad is going to happen. But uh, yes, that was good foresight and um, much later it would be rolled out. Also this year, we had the uh, official recommendation for HTTP with a post body. So this was really the first time you could not just download things, you could also submit forms as well. But by this time, 1.1, which was quite a bit uh, more efficient, uh, was already being commonly used. And uh, two undergraduates, uh, Larry Page and Sergi Bring, began collaborating on a new search engine and they called it Backrub and uh, e-business was coined and there were 36 million users by the end of the year. Also this year, um, a lot of developers, uh, some developers are a bit lazy and they say, uh, let, let's just support one browser and, they, and, they, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee wasn't very happy with that. He said, anyone who slaps uh, this page is best viewed with browser X label on a web page appears to be yearning for the bad old days before the web. And uh, the following year, we had uh, Macworld, a big announcement that they were going to partner up with Microsoft. And uh, there were jeers from the audience when they announced that uh, Internet Explorer was would ship as the default browser on the, the Macintosh, but um, Steve Jobs managed to uh, talk some of the uh, dissenting voices around by saying, we have to let go of this notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. And it's the beginning of the dot-com boom. Everybody is realizing there's good money to be made, or potentially, in dot-com websites. And, and we had the first uh, specification for ECMAScript. Uh, despite uh, common belief, ECMA is not a skin disease. It stands for European Computer Manufacturers Association. And the ECMAScript is the language specification for the implementation that's known as JavaScript. And this year, it's, it's the browser wars. So uh, internet, Explorer 4 launches, and they have a 
post-release party, and uh, I, I think some people got quite drunk. Uh, one thing led to another, and a nine-foot uh, Internet Explorer logo ended up on Netscape's lawn. And uh, a few people at Netscape weren't very happy, knocked it over, sprayed uh, Netscape now, and put the uh, Mozilla mascot on the top. And a sign that says Netscape 722 Microsoft 18, that was, was the uh, usage figures at the time. Uh, but uh, Internet Explorer 4 would prove to be very popular. And we had increasing standardization, HTML4 spec. Uh, the viewable with any browser campaign begins. That's partly inspired by what Tim Berners-Lee said. And Auction Web is renamed to eBay, and that continues to grow quickly. We have the antitrust case beginning uh, against Microsoft for uh, deploying uh, or releasing Internet Explorer with the operating system and uh, there's Bill Gates in court and we also had CSS2 1998 Google it's in the beta but PC magazine says there's much more to come at Google even in its prototype form it's a great search engine and they had 9800 searches a day which they were very happy with at the time 1999 this is uh, one of these really small things that happened at the time that would prove to be really important for web developers. And, and at the bottom here, we have Alex Hopman's website that has the full story. Um, but this technology, XML HTTP requests, would uh, prove to be really important for speeding up uh, the World Wide Web. And, uh, that was shipped as a, an add-on for uh, Internet Explorer 5. We have uh, ECMAScript 3 released. We have a JavaScript-like programming language for Flash 4. It didn't have a name at the time. And uh, Salesforce was founded. Yeah. 2000 is the beginning of the collapse of dot-com business. Um, just a lot of uh, software wasn't as good as uh, investors hoped it would be and there wasn't the technology for video wasn't very good uh, internet connections weren't quite as fast as some people hoped they would be at the time various different reasons uh, that there was uh, the millennium bug was uh, just uh, just gone past um, things weren't quite as rosy as people hoped they'd be. And uh, some companies went bust, but there were, there were some good things going on at this time as well. There was uh, x.com bucking the trends. It was renamed to PayPal and carried on expanding rapidly. And we had the iPod with iTunes. We had Wikipedia launched, Creative Commons, WebKit projects announced by Apple. We had Internet Explorer 6 and uh, the first commercial launch of 3G in Japan. New beginnings. Uh, Web 2.0. So there's a few different definitions of Web 2.0. Uh, a common one is, is really due to the rise of blogging because it was a new way of uh, using the internet, uh, the early World Wide Web was really just about downloading documents, kind of standard uh, text and maybe an image here and there. And there's a new usage, people are not just downloading information, they're uploading information, they're talking about themselves, and messaging was uh, starting to kick off quite, uh, and become very popular as well. And uh, so the media brand did that one, Web 2.0. Also this year we had ASP.net, that was a big improvement o over the earlier ASP. And uh, at, in 2002, uh, Netscape were no more, um, but many of the employees from Netscape um, worked for a new company called Mozilla, and they wanted to call their browser Phoenix because it was rising from the ashes of Netscape. And this was 
supporting XML HTTP requests. And uh, at, at the time, we had th this kind of crappy code that you'd have to write because we have all these different kind of versions of uh, XHR because there wasn't a standard that everyone was using. Um, and we also had NGINX uh, being developed in Russia and 600 million users on the internet. Safari, fastest browser on the Mac. And the first one with Google integrated into the browser. And iTunes 4 was the first version to come with a music store. And uh, although Mozilla wanted it to be uh, Phoenix, they couldn't because Phoenix Technologies claimed uh, in trademark infringement. So they renamed it to Firebird. And in 2004, thefacebook.com was launched. Uh, who saw the film The Social Network? Some, some of you? You know, some, some of it is not 100% true. Uh, quite a lot of it was. He was sued by his ex-classmates, and uh, I think he, he gained, ended up giving 1.25 million shares. So if they'd kept on to those, they, they could be worth good money now. And, uh, Yes. Also this year, Gmail. Uh, almost everybody thought this was an April Fool's joke because uh, Google gave a kind of a quirky announcement saying, uh, heck yeah, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, 500 times more storage than Hotmail. And everybody said, yeah, right, yeah, of course. But it, it wasn't a joke, it was real. And um, work begins on HTML5 and uh, Mozilla unfortunately could not name it Firebird either because uh, uh, the Firebird database uh, community said you can't call it Firebird, you, that's uh, our name. So they decided they'd call it Firefox but then they found in the UK there was a company called Firefox so that, that wasn't good either but they managed to resolve that and eventually called it Firefox and released it. Also this year, there's a thousand employees uh, gathered to work on a secret project at Apple called Project Purple. Following year, um, Ajax is coined for the term for XML HTTP requests. And uh, really up until now, it wasn't well known about because there wasn't really a name for it. It wasn't really um, advertised very well, um, but this name became popular and uh, books started coming out on Ajax, learning Ajax, and usage of it um, increased dramatically. Also in 2005, we have YouTube, we have Skype technologies bought by eBay, we have Google acquiring Android, and Steve Jobs and the Google guys making the Time 100. And we have WebKit open source. We have the rise of model view controller web architectures, uh, web objects bundled with Xcode. We've got Ruby on Rails. We've got the Django for Python. And we've also got lots of books out for some of the Java framework, Spring and JSF. 2006. It's the beginning of the area of the cloud computing, also known as on-demand computing. Uh, shared processing resources and data uh, on demand. And Amazon Web Services was launched and uh, it's always been the most popular of the cloud providers. And uh, also this year we had work on I will that beginning at Twitter. Um, and speaking of Twitter, we've got some early designs of Twitter that kind of look a lot different to how we remember it now. Um, but it shows how, how, how much it's changed over the years. We also had jQuery released. 2007 is the year of the iPhone. Johnny Ive was uh, named the product designer of the year by GK magazine 
and uh, we, here we can see how much smaller and more elegant it was than the older message pad. And we had silver light, we had laptop, one laptop per child shipping $100 connected laptops out to the third world and we had uh, Google releasing Street View and availing uh, its vision of a, a new mobile device platform called Android. And the following year it released Android 1 and it also released the Chrome browser so it was entering new markets and a pretty good year for them. Microsoft were uh, not quite as uh, finished but they were busy and hard working on Microsoft Azure. Uh, they tried to buy Yahoo for 40 billion dollars but Yahoo said it, it wasn't enough money and uh, there were two million emails per second sent even in 2008. Um, by 2009 it was pretty clear that XHTML2 uh, wasn't going anywhere and XHTML5 was going to be the future and uh, also this year ASP.NET MVC was re released and uh, Node.js was released uh, only supported Linux at the time Internet Explorer 8 came out as well and also we had Bitcoin the first major cryptocurrency and AngularJS 2010 the cloud war is heating up we've got Azure released we've got cloud.com OpenStack, there's a lot of different cloud providers coming into the market. And we have in 2011 the iPad, I, Internet Explorer 9, and Microsoft buys out Skype communications. And Microsoft helps Node.js to support Windows, and uh, Isaac Schluter, I think is uh, the creator of NPM and we kind of have a, a second browser wars around 2012 uh, Internet Explorer 10 comes out and from a standards point of view it's pretty good it's got supports HTML5 and CSS3 but this year Google Chrome overtakes Internet Explorer as the most widely used browser and Microsoft released a few different um, products so this is the start of a kind of a new uh, philosophy at Microsoft um, this Scott Guthrie had quite a lot to do with the changing direction at Microsoft uh, saying we should uh, be releasing more things as open source uh, to, to help developers and we also had the OS OS2 spec and speedy Google speedy they have a technology to speed up the World Wide Web that they call Speedy and uh, this year we have the launch of IPv6 this supports uh, 340 trillion 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 addresses so I think it may keep us going for a little bit longer uh, we have uh, leaks from Snowden well, um, he took asylum in Russia this year and the Guardian say that only a few documents have been released also this year we have uh, react.js released by Facebook or created by Facebook I'm not sure if it was public released then um, but it was certainly created by Facebook uh, in 2013 uh, we had the Android KitKat release and we have uh, WebGL, Speedy and JavaScript enhancements in Internet Explorer 11. The Connected Car Expo, the first one of those was in 2013. This was really a sign of um, a new market for co connected devices in cars and um, the idea of driverless cars was coming to fruition around then and some big companies getting involved in this uh, first exposition. 2014 
We have Facebook buying Oculus VR for $2 billion. They're really quite serious about the idea of virtual reality. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg says virtual reality was once the dream of science fiction. But the internet was also once a dream. And so were computers and smartphones. The future is coming and we have a chance to build it together. Also this year, we have the heart bleed bug. We have half a million uh, secure web servers which are vulnerable to private key theft and uh, users session cookies and passwords being stolen and uh, there was a guy called Paul Henning Camp who, who gave a talk a few weeks before that was announced and he uh, almost predicted what, would what was about to happen and uh, so I recommend uh, watching that talk if you've got time um, only 40%, well, as much as 40%, I should say, of the world wide world population is using the World Wide Web. But uh, we'd obviously like to improve that. Um, Sim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee gives a TED talk in Vancouver in and calls for a Magna Carta uh, for the web. We and we have the final recommendation of HTML5. Uh, a lot of people have been using it in different forms uh, by that time. And we have uh, Android Lollipop and iOS 8. And uh, we have a, what was still mostly you know, called ES6, ECMAScript Skips, becomes ECMAScript 2015. It's a big release for JavaScript, many new features. And uh, many of them go into Node.js and uh, this year we also have uh, Microsoft Edge, which comes with Windows 10, and uh, they removed a lot of the old Internet Explorer legacy code and, and did a major rewrite uh, for web standards and interoperability, and they open sourced their JavaScript engine as well. And we also have Vue, the first version of Vue.js announced, uh, released. HTTP2. So this is what Speedy, well, this is mostly based on Speedy. Uh, there were a few changes um, to how, it, how Speedy was, um, but it's, um, most of the ideas of Speedy are incorporated into HTTP2. And uh, so uh, a lot of uh, companies are now um, changing their websites uh, to support HTTP2. Um, you can only use it if you're using one of the latest browsers and you also have to have a server uh, that's pretty modern as well and that supports that. Uh, if you're a, a Microsoft Windows user, you, you need to have Windows Server 2016 uh, if, unless you want to use uh, Apache or NGINX or, or another uh, provider other than Microsoft. And uh, if you go into support to HTTP2, some of your optimizations for HTTP 1.1 might become counterproductive. Um, this year, Google um, was ruled to uh, be abusing its position, uh, favoring its own comparison shopping product and its results. And we have the release of new mobile operating systems, and we have 3 billion users on the internet. We also have uh, a dispute between the FBI and Apple um, over unlocking a terrorist's phone. And that was due to go to court, but um, the FBI paid unnamed computer hackers to unlock the phone, and the hearing never went ahead. Um, but also we've uh, heard that allegedly the NSA has been hacked um, Andreessen is saying here if the US government can't keep highly classified exploits secure why would anyone think golden encryption keys can possibly be kept secure um, and this is a, a big issue at the moment uh, Hillary Clinton is uh, calling for uh, tech companies to do more to fight uh, the war against terrorists and uh, there, there is a 
big debate over kind of privacy and security. Also this year, we have uh, a bit of a mess up. Uh, so there's a one developer um, uh, publishes uh, a module called Kick, and there's a company called Kick who says uh, you're not allowed to use that name. That's our name. Uh, so he decided in the end, he was so fed up he was going to unpublish all 272 of his modules and uh, one of those broke thousands of builds all around the world and, uh, and NPM decided to republish it and managed to get that working again. Um, but there's a string padding proposal uh, that's been submitted so hopefully that will make it into the language itself. We also have some new uh, JavaScript frameworks, um, Aurelia, Angular 2, we've got uh, version 2 of Vue.js coming out pretty soon, and uh, virtual reality. Uh, Oculus Rift has just gone in sale. We also have HTC Vive, we've got Samsung Gear VR. There's a lot of different uh, companies selling virtual reality now, and it's not clear yet who will actually win uh, market dominance yet because uh, obviously Facebook are pretty serious about virtual reality but so are HTC and so is Valve, so are Samsung. So we don't know yet. Uh, we have a project led by Sim Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, well we kind of gone full circle to some extent. We started off with a decentralized World Wide Web. But now we have a few big companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft who kind of know everything about you. So uh, this is an idea of kind of regaining some of the control of uh, what information you share. And, but also being that social as well. Um, so that was the past. What about the future? Well. There are some things that are quite predictable and then there are things that aren't very predictable. We're going to have a lot more devices connected to the internet. And, uh, it's predicted there's going to be 50 billion connected devices by 2020. So that's six devices for every person. We've got 5G technology coming out. So uh, mobile networks are going to get pretty good. Um, the EU have recently said that every village and city is going to have free Wi-Fi access and they're going to be rolling out 5G networks across the European Union by 2025. Um, but one thing I think this is the most important thing is uh, it's easy to forget uh, that most of the world still doesn't have access to the internet. Um, just uh, every day, I, um, using the internet is just so normal to me now. It's, it's hard to imagine that there are so many people without uh, any connection to the internet. Um, so I think that's one thing that we'd really like to change in the future. And uh, it's up to you. How do you want the future to be? And we are developers we have the control or we have the potential to build the world that we want to live in. So thank you very much for coming to see me and wish you a good night. <laughs> Any questions at all? I have questions about the cloud services space. Can you just say a little bit more about how Amazon took its lead early on and why it took so long, or well, so long comparatively for some of the other big players who are now competing in that um, space to kind of catch up? I think they just had the idea earlier than other companies. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in, on cloud technologies, but I, I believe that Amazon were in, in the kind of the area where they realized that cloud computing, they needed some of that for their own business. And they realized that there was going to be a huge market for that. 
and, and they had some good engineers uh, working there. Um, so they just had that product out first and, and they did a good job of listening to the feedback from other people and they've always um, been good at uh, keeping a fast service. Um, I think it may well be that another competitor uh, knocks them off the market share. Um, Microsoft are very serious about Azure and I think a lot more people are using Azure now or, or seeing that there's a lot of offerings from Azure, for example, and Google have, you know, loads of different features available on the cloud. And that's just uh, a few people. There are so many different providers uh, offering different services available. So, um, yeah, I think uh, they're all pretty good. So. Do you have a view on where the kind of battleground is going to be played out? Is it going to be around features? Is it going to be around speed? Is it going to be become commoditized and be around more around cost? Um, well, I think all of those things are very important. Um, some businesses are very price sensitive. Others are not, have just got money to spend and they really want the fastest thing available. And uh, there's always going to be uh, an interest in having new features. Uh, there's every company has its own needs and uh, Anything that uh, provides a program that is closer and involves lower development costs in-house is a very good thing. And, and really, um, uh, developer time is very expensive, so it's usually a lot cheaper to, to buy rather than build. Um, but um, it's going to be a mixture of things. Uh, there's, there's definitely uh, room for quite a few different providers, but uh, we've also seen uh, small companies getting uh, bought out by bigger companies. I, I can't really see that changing anytime soon. I think that's just going to carry on um, the way it has been. I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned virtual reality, and, but you focused on hardware. Do you have a view on software? Well, I, th I think uh, a lot of um, developers have been interested in getting involved with it, but it's been a kind of a chicken and an egg situation. Uh, the, the early version of uh, Oculus made a lot of people sick, and that kind of people thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll try that, and then they felt sick and they thought, oh, I think I'd do something else, program, learn a new language or something instead. So, but now, um, it's, it's people are realizing this is real. It's actually been released now. So I think we'll get a lot more developers um, having different ideas about what software uh, can be made with it. I don't think we've, we haven't seen a killer app yet. And really, we're waiting for the big release that makes everybody go, wow, I need to buy that. Because until the software is released, until s there's some software that really blows people away, people aren't going to spend 500 or more pounds on uh, software. It's just, with that amazing software, it's just an expensive toy. So um, I definitely think we will we'll see that and probably within the next year we'll see something amazing. And uh, I think that will really determine who wins uh, the biggest market share in virtual reality. You mentioned at the end with Sir Tim Berners Lee about yeah. open data system. Could you talk a bit about how that could work or if the details have been released? Yeah, I, I think it's best to take a look at uh, the website. So we'll take a quick look. So. So it's, it's kind of uh, not 100% clear in term exactly how this is going to work. There's a, lot of, a lot of this is quite early, to be honest. It's not a full product yet. It's, there's a lot of stuff that's open source, but it doesn't feel like a, a, f a full product yet. Um, it's really just uh, an interesting idea um, that I think could come to fruition. 
and if enough people are interested in the idea then um, I think good things could happen. Um, but yeah, I recommend to have a look through uh, the website, it's quite, quite interesting. Is, is, is it the idea that it would be a platform that sits on top of the World Wide Web and, 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 and shapes how users view the web and interact with the web? Yeah, it's a, it's a software platform um, that it would kind of c compete with uh, other social networks like Facebook and Google Plus. Um, but um, be I think it could have commercial um, opportunities as well. Um, but it was really the kind of the idea about it is um, moving away from this centralized system where uh, all the data goes to one place. It's really about kind of empowering individuals. So <coughs> one of the things I saw is it's roughly 16 years from IPv6 being announced as a spec to actually being released. <laughs> what are your comments on how long that took? Um, probably too long, but <laughs> also uh, a lot of people still use IPv4 even now. No, no. Um, well, the thing is, um, people just tend to be a bit lazy, and unless there's a, an urgent need to change something, uh, that then people generally don't. And uh, I, that attitude is not always wrong. Um, it t t costs money to change infrastructure, and it, it takes people's time up. If you if you're running a business, you want to be focused on your business. Uh, if you can go too far in the direction of new technology and uh, spend so much of your time chasing the latest thing, you, you forget to focus on your customers. Um, but having said that, I think it uh, um, makes sense to use IPv6. It makes sense to use HTTP2 as well for most businesses. Not, not everyone, but um, there's, there are always new technologies coming out that are worth investigating and assessing it as to whether that they're suitable for your business. It's interesting just because we kind of, we have NAP and, and really nobody's seen you, shown me too much of IPv6 that we haven't really kind of solved by doing network address translation. So it's, it's still kind of waiting for that other than it's something we know we should do, but there's no real urgency in doing it. Yes, I would agree with that, definitely. Sorry.